Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. Um, I want to welcome all of you uh, for today's event, Planning for Industrial Neighbors, How to Live with the Stuff We Have to Have. Uh, my name is Shelley Rapp, and I'm chair of the Committee of 100 on the Federal City. Uh, the committee was founded 100 years ago um, to sustain and safeguard the fundamental values <clears throat> of the Lawn Font and Macmillan plans that give the nation's capital its distinction, beauty, and rich community character. Today, our all-volunteer <clears throat> members are active citywide on a wide range of issues, um, including affordable housing, land use, planning, and zoning. That's the topic for today. Climate change, transportation, historic preservation, and open space conservation. As I said, two, 2023 is our centennial year. We're marking this milestone by holding a series of events that we are calling Conversations, focusing on some of our city's challenges. The speakers for this evening will be Uwe Brandeis from Georgetown University, Talib Din Ugda uh, from the Northern Bus Barn Neighbors, and Opera Navora from DC Water. Um, I'll introduce each before their formal presentation, but a brief biography of each is in your program. We will reserve time for questions from the audience after these speaker, after all speakers um, have spoken. To ask a question, please go to the center aisle um, and line up uh, behind the microphone. If there's anyone here that uh, um, doesn't want to go to the microphone or is unable to go to the microphone to ask questions, just raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. Um, please keep your questions brief um, so that our speakers can engage in conversation with each other. Caroline Petty will, um, uh, will moderate the question and answer period. Caroline is a longtime member of the Committee of 100, one-time chair and member of the Committee of 100's Housing Subcommittee and currently serves on our Zoning Subcommittee. Since she retired from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Ms. Petty has been actively engaged in citywide and neighborhood housing development and related envir environmental justice issues. Ms. Petty lives in Ward 5, where much of D.C.'s industrial zone land is located. I also want to acknowledge um, Laura Richards, um, a community activist and longtime member of the Committee of 100 and past chair, who led the team that organized uh, today's event. Thank you, Laura. Um, after the program, please join us for refreshments and conversation in the Narthex. Committee of 100 members will be identified um, by badges, and we invite you to talk to any of us to learn more about our organization. We welcome new members. Um, and we hope to see you, we also hope to see you here at our next event, which we are titling Reclaiming the Commons, the Value of Public Space, which will be held on Wednesday, March, May, excuse me, May 24th here in the church, beginning at 630. Um, our first panelist will be Uwe uh, Brandeis, uh, do you want to come up here? Um, um, Uwe um, cut his teeth um, in D.C. planning, working with the Anacostia Watershed Initiative. He has had multifaceted plan a multifaceted planning uh, uh, career in the in the intersection of academia and public policy. He currently heads Georgetown University's urban and regional planning program and also directs directs Georgetown's Global Cities Initiative. He also currently chairs the DC Commission on Climate Change and Resilience. Um, given, given the breadth of his interests and experience, he is here today to address how cities plan for the underbelly of his built environment, waste disposal sites, utilities, and all the other things we got to have. So with that, Uwe, you wanna come up here? Thank you.
Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Um, and it's always an honor and pleasure to be with you here at the committee. And I, of course, want to um, wish you a happy 100th birthday. Uh, that's a very, oh, how about this? Is that better? Okay, great. So thank you so much for having me. Um, happy birthday, Committee of 100. I think it's really, really great. Yeah, and I think it's terrific. I've been following the programs and um, it's t terrific. Uh, I did want to put in a little plug. I saw that you have um, done some programming on climate change and I, and I did want to make everyone aware that uh, we have a relatively new or organization or, or um, kind of division of the district uh, called the Commission on Climate Change and Resiliency. And this is an independent um, <clears throat> commission formed by the DC City Council. And um, the mayor, mayor has asked me to, to chair it, which is my great, great honor. Uh, Maureen Holman, who I know um, was uh, uh, also invited to this tonight, uh, she serves on the commission and, um, and, and several other folks do as well. Um, we recently uh, published our second report. So this commission has um, the power of the pen and, and nothing else. Uh, so we have no regulatory function at all. Um, but we have a charge from the DC City Council to prepare a report to the mayor and to the council every three years. Um, and so we've just completed our second report uh, and that can be found on, on the website. I can circulate the, the, the website afterwards. Um, but I was delighted to see that uh, the Committee of 100 is interested in climate change because um, I think it's an important factor that's really going to shape our city uh, in many, many different ways, both on the energy side, but also on the um, what what in the terminology is described as the um, adaptation side of, of things. Um, so I've um, I, I think this is a terrific topic for tonight. I've I've only I've brought a couple of slides and I'm not going <laughs> to. Don't worry, I'm not going to lecture you. Um, I, I just do want to. Uh, raise a couple of points or ideas around this issue of industrial um, land uses in cities uh, and speak just a tiny little bit to some of the work that I did when I was at the DC Office of Planning and then afterwards at the um, Anacostia Waterfront Corporation. Um, so let's see if this works. Do I point it in any one direction? Or can I just ask you to advance the slide? It's up there. Perfect. Has anyone been to Fez in Morocco? Okay. Interesting, right? Um, I would consider this to be an industrial use. Um, it is a t tannery uh, and dyeing um, for fabrics and leathers, primarily uh, tannery for leathers. And goodness, it is right in the middle of the city. Um, n not the most environmentally friendly <laughs> use, <laughs> uh, but I do think it's quite interesting and important to understand the underlying relationship between industrial uses and the city around it. And in this case, I mean, it makes sense, right? I mean, this was the kind of generator of economic value within this medieval city. And it would make sense, right, that that use was at the center of, of, of the city, certainly the center of many neighborhoods around it. And so <clears throat> um, one of the reasons why I wanted to start off with this image is that we have, and I sense even in the organization of this event, kind of a, a, a we automatically bias this conversation about industrial uses to be pejorative. Um, and uh, we, we need industrial uses. I mean, it's the economy. We have to have uh, industrial uses. And, and, and we can talk more about this um, in, in dialogue, but actually we are a city in, in Washington that uh, is remarkably, um, uh, R remarkably la lax <laughs> industrial uses compared to so many other 
um, of our cities around us. Okay, so that's Fez, and that's industrial use. It's right in the middle of the city. Whoops. Okay. Perfect. Anyone been to Pittsburgh? Show of hands. Um, I mean, the organization of the neighborhoods in Pittsburgh have everything to do with the steel mills in Pittsburgh. I mean, one of the classic industrial uses in the American city. And um, so here we have um, a series of really interesting uh, um, urban infrastructure elements that connect where people live to where people work. Um, you see the steps going down uh, and connecting to the streets that lead down to the steel mills along along the river. Uh, and so again, this is in a, in a more kind of American expression, um, this uh, kind of uh, uh, important link between industrial uses and neighborhoods. Um, <clears throat> I think Pittsburgh's, of course, um, a, a more tangible example for us of the kind of noxious um, impact that industrial uses have on the quality of life in neighborhoods. Um, this photograph is relatively um, tame compared to other photographs that I'm sure many people have seen of Pittsburgh where, um, you know, the city lights were turned on in the middle of the day because of so much smog and uh, pollution in the air. Uh, and, um, and so the impact is, is of course, um, extraordinary. Uh, but still, this kind of land use relationship between uh, neighborhoods and industrial uses is, is inextricable. Um, Let's see. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of our um, ideas and a lot of our framing of industrial uses goes back to kind of the early innovations at the time uh, in urban planning. And this is a diagram taken from the 1929 regional plan uh, for New York, which was such an important milestone in planning theory. And if you look at this diagram, and let's see if this works. Whoops. Oh, no. Oh. Uh, OK. Um, so here we see, uh, this is a conceptual diagram in, in the 1929 plan. It's a regional plan, a huge innovation. Um, and here we can see the kind of the little pictogram of, of Manhattan. Yeah. Does that work? Yeah, perfect. So here you see the little little diagram pictogram of Manhattan, right? Um, the explosion of residential uses outside of Manhattan, embracing this um, very pastoral idea of living closer to nature. So you see that um, represented here in this diagram, and you, you see the home as the center of land, land uses um, in, in the suburb. Um, but then, uh, and this is really important, I think, down off to the bottom here um, is the representation of industrial uses. And in the context of the New York metropolitan area, I mean, this is not just one little factory. This is like extensive swaths of land, particularly around the ports um, that sustained industrial uses and sustained the livelihoods of people living in, in New York. Um, and I think what is really important here is the planning idea, really the planning philosophy of the time of separating land uses out from one another. Um, which it is this kind of very modernist idea of single use um, of zoning. And the second big idea here is that this is all predicated um, on the car, on the ability to actually drive from one area to another. So um, we have uh, entirely new uh, ways of thinking about industrial uses in the, in the kind of middle of the 20th. Um, and I do want to point to this case study, which I think is also really, really, really important. How many people have been to Vancouver, British Columbia? Okay, great. Um, 
So in Vancouver um, is um, a, 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 an industrial island in, in their former port area uh, called Granville Island. And so here you see on the left, uh, kind of historic expression of those industrial uses. And Granville Island, I think, is incredibly important because it was the first celebrated, may maybe not the first attempt ever, but first, certainly the first celebrated um, attempt to really think about industrial uses in a transition um, as not... Um, um, being f fixed, uh, but as being part of a trans transitioning urban economy. And what is so extraordinary about Granville Island, you see it on the right now, and I happen to have um, visited it last summer, it still includes industrial uses. There's a major, one of the city's largest concrete batch plants right in the middle of, of Granville Island. And yet, it is also the city's number one tourist destination um, with incredible uh, uses, including these enormous farmers markets, uh, enormous uh, kind of maker spaces and new kinds of, 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 of small business production. Um, and it has been extremely well managed and systematically transformed um, through this very amazing partnership between the city of Vancouver and the f federal, the s national government of, of of Canada that owns owns the land, um, and so uh, I think and and it w and justifiably so. There are so many horrific examples of industrial uses and its in, and their impacts on communities and cities, um, but I point to a couple of examples here where there has been an attempt to proactively manage the land uses in a way that um, allows for uh, the industrial uses to um, to exist and for um, the urban economies around them to, to evolve. Um, I did want to just say a few words about some of the work that I did um, <clears throat> together with many of you and with many, many other people. Um, uh, about 20 years ago now in the um, Capitol Riverfront and Capitol Gateway area. Um, and in um, up to about 2000, uh, maybe two or three, um, this entire area was the largest industrial zone in the city. Uh, so the entire, what we all very affectionately call um, Buzzards Point, um, uh, was the largest land area that was industrially zoned in, in the city. And um, through zoning, we um, uh, essentially created, uh, through, through an overlay zone, cre created um, what was, I think, called the Capital Gateway Overlay Zone, if I'm not mistaken. And in that zone, uh, frankly, like with lots of inspiration from Granville Island, um, we allowed for all of the industrial uses on Buzzards Point to be grandfathered in, um, uh, while also uh, allowing for the development of residential uses um, for the very first time in this part of the city. Uh, and um, and so I think that's kind of one example from from uh, inside DC that we can look to to see how that transition um, occurred and how it was managed. And zoning was not the only tool to manage that, but was um, foundational to allowing for new uses in. And I just want to end. I've just gotten my uh, my hook. Um, I just wanted to end um, because I know we will be hearing from DC Water. Um, there's so much work that has gone on, gone into the coordination between the pumping stations, um, the O Street pump station in particular, but the others around it as well, to think about those incredibly important industrial uses, really major infrastructure uses that simply cannot be moved anywhere else. Um, and I, I, I led a little feasibility study to explore that. It is prohibitively expensive uh, to move those uh, uses. Um, and it is so remarkable. I was just down there the other day 
These are citywide industrial uses at the center of our fastest growing neighborhood in the entire city. It's absolutely remarkable. Um, and uh, one of the things that, and I know some of you are very interested in this, one of the things that's really extraordinary about it is that the o, o Street pumping station really truly is an exemplary element of, of, of the architectural history of Washington. I mean, it's a beautiful Beaux-Arts building. Um, happens to be an industrial use, um, and it is now at the very center of a whole new neighborhood. I think, you know, it's really hard to have um, to, to, uh, to have kind of anticipated that um, decades ago. Um, and now we know that there are means in which uh, we can co coexist within the same place. Different uses can coexist. Um, and I'm just going to end, though, with a kind of cautionary, cautionary note, and I'm sure we'll um, drill down into this more in discussion. There um, are uh, <clears throat> asynchronous uh, impacts of industrial uses um, with, uh, you know, many legacy pollutants in this neighborhood. And while land use is important, um, the many, many um, environmental control and regulatory frameworks are equally important. And the Washington Navy Yard itself, which used to be the most you know, Im important and kind of biggest uh, industrial use in the city, has left a, a, a legacy of pollution that will be managed for many, many decades to come. And so there's a whole groundwater regime here in this neighborhood to clean um, uh, those pollutants um, up with very complicated legal agreements between the federal government and the city and the landowners. In this case, uh, the Washington Navy Yard was the only Superfund site within Washington, D.C., and this is just a kind of a legacy of the fact that um, industrial uses were there. Uh, and I just want to close by saying that um, we, we just can't have this conversation without um, embracing the important frameworks being um, that have, have certainly already been developed but continue to be developed around environmental justice. Uh, because the manner in which industrial uses have been um, uh, managed within the cities has everything to do with social and racial justice in, in our cities. And, and so um, it was a little bit less pronounced here in this neighborhood because there really were um, um, lots of, there was so much vacant land, there were n n not many um, uh, residential neighborhoods right right here. With the exception of, and this is you know no coincidence, we did have two of the very largest public housing um, uh, sites in this neighborhood as well. So, you know, the, the, these issues are very complicated, um, and I, I'm just thankful that we have the opportunity tonight to enter into dialogue. I just wanted to kind of set the table with some considerations as we as we proceed. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. That was uh, quite enlightening. Um, okay, our second panelist is Talib Din Ugda. Um, uh, when when Mamada when Wamada, excuse me, decided to open the Northern Bus Garage on 14th Street, it proposed saddling this neighborhood with diesel buses and and a bus repair shop, including vehicle paint jobs, to ameliorate. Adverse, adverse impacts, WMATA proposed to filter diesel exhaust fumes. The ANC approved the plan, and then Talib Din Ugda formed the Northern Bus Garage Neighbors, which against formidable odds persuaded WMATA to abandon this health and environmental hazard. When the bus bar barn opens in 2027, it will house only all electric buses with zero emissions. Uh, for, some of us here live in Ward 3, and we're looking up to Tlaib uh, to tell us how to deal with the, the bus garage in our neighborhood um, on, in, near, in Friendship Heights, where it's, which is 
going through the same process as the Northern Bus Garage. So with that, turn it over. To well, good evening, everyone. And thank you and happy birthday. Uh, I think we all have an obligation to, to recognize that. Um, in fact, um, in a couple of weeks, I'll be 71. So I'm looking, I'm looking forward to my birthday as well. So listen, I've been given 15 minutes to at least introduce to you all five things. The first one was, or the first, yeah, the first one is how and why we organized the Northern Bus Bond Neighbors. How did we keep the momentum going? Because it's easy to organize. It's easy for four or five people to get together and decide that we're going to do a certain thing. And you look up a couple of days, a couple of weeks, months, years. How do you keep that same energy going that started that first night? I also want to speak on how we negotiated with WMATA for a successful outcome. It wasn't easy. And I wouldn't even call it a negotiation. It was more of a pestering, a nonstop pestering by exposing them to the ridiculous idea that you would spend anywhere from eight to $12 million on a stranded asset. We wouldn't do that in our own homes. So why would you want to do that at a bus garage? And so the last two things I want to cover are the things that I think all of us could learn. I know the things that I learned. And I'll tell you, Whenever you go into something like this, WMATA and entities like them, they have a vision. They think they know what it is that they want to do. But I would encourage all of you that are doing this type of work to have your own vision. And that's what you push. They've got an idea. You've got an idea doesn't make their idea better than yours. What made the difference in this case was me trying to make someone see my idea at their building. It's like me coming to your house and deciding that you shouldn't have the couch over here. Let's put it over on the window over there. Well, it's not my house. But what I recognized was you were in my neighborhood. And I get to say what it is that you can do in my neighborhood. And so we had to organize because no one else would. We could not depend on the mayor. We could not depend on the council. And as you heard a little earlier during the introduction, we couldn't even depend on the ANC. And I happen to live in a neighborhood 16th Street Heights, that the associations there have told me we don't want to get involved in this because we don't want to do anything that's controversial. But it's killing you. Well, they say they're going to do better. And you believe them? And so I met a great deal of resistance because when we first started, which was in 2018. This is when this first started. They did a presentation in 2018. Now, I will tell you, I'm going to give you this advice first, because this is one of the things I learned, and I learned this from WMATA on the first night they came to do a presentation in 2018. There was a room, if you can imagine, all these chairs were filled, standing room only. And the first thing the people at WMATA did was to thank the community for not booing them out the room. 
because they did the same presentation that they were going to do for us. They did it up in Shepherd Park for the Walter Reed complex. And Wamada said, we didn't even get through the presentation. They booed us out the room. Now, we're polite in 16th Street Heights. We, we like to give you the opportunity to be able to do your presentation, and then we lower the hammer. So the question kept coming up, well, Mr. Ukda, you seem to be the only one that wants this. I mean, where, where is your evidence that the neighbors want this? Have you done a survey? Oh, okay. So we did a survey. We got nearly 500 responses and the community spoke loud and clear about what they wanted. Comparatively, when WMATA did a survey, they barely got 200 responses, barely. And when I, and in fact, that number cre increased to almost 200 because initially they only reported like less than 100. And when I called them out on it and said, well, we got 500 in ours, then the numbers changed. But they couldn't, they couldn't go from less than 100 to almost 500, but they moved the numbers up. And this was just for artwork. Our survey was more encompassing. We wanted to know, do you have a problem with diesel buses? What would you like to see there? WMATA, understand, when you're talking about WMATA, they are a quasi-government agency. The District of Columbia, the state of Maryland, and the state of Virginia has no jurisdiction over WMATA whatsoever. None. They cannot tell them what to do. They can suggest it. If WMATA wanted not to show up for a public hearing, nothing the city could do. They have no authority over them whatsoever. WMATA was created by Congress, and they can pretty much do what they want to do until we were able to get word inside of the government, inside of the Congress, that you all are about to waste my tax dollars on a stranded asset for two Two, 5,000 diesel fuel tanks to go underground, transmission fluid, antifreeze, oil, and the tanks for the waste. That just did not make sense to me, and I'm an entrepreneur. I understand what it is to invest in something, and you want to look for a return on your investment. To spend eight to $12 million putting stuff underground, and then five, six years down the road, you were gonna to have to take it out or just cut it off and just leave it down there. It made absolutely no sense. So we formed the Northern Bus Barn Neighbors, NBN. There was a group of us. In fact, one of our officers is sitting back there, Ray Bridgewater and, and Ramey Rahini. The three of us came together, we incorporated. We formed a non-profit corporation in the District of Columbia, and I have kept that corporation in good standing. That's the other thing I want you to understand. I learned a long time ago, and I see the fruition of it today. You have to be willing to put your money behind what it is you believe in. And I learned that. I learned that when I did presentations at the Cato Institute and the Heritage Foundation and the Institute for Justice. Every time I turned around, I realized that there were people who believed in what it was that they were doing. I don't care how you feel about it politically. They believed in it enough that they were left millions in endowments. Who in this room is willing to leave their house to a foundation? That's what was happening. People were putting money behind what they believed in. And when, when, when I left that group, when I left those presentations and speaking engagements to that group, that was one thing that I took away. So it was nothing for me to set up 
this corporation to continue its function, to keep it in good standing, so that every time I go and testify, I can say that we are a nonprofit organization in good standing. That makes a difference. You're not just loosey-goosey, just giving it a name and then deciding that you and your friend are going to act like you are the organization. No. You want, you, and the other reason you want to do this is because as an individual, whenever you go to testify, you don't get but three minutes. When you're an organization, you get five. You can use those extra two minutes. And I played those extra two minutes every opportunity. Are, are you here personally as an, oh, as an organization, sir? So you seize on those opportunities. We kept the momentum in this thing going by always revealing, by being transparent. By saying to the community, reminding the community, the things that we were doing on their behalf. This wasn't about me. This was about bettering the environment. And you need to understand, I'm making this presentation to you. I'm a young man that grew up here in Washington, D.C. At the age of eight, nine, ten years old, I used to like sticking my head out of the back of my father's Oldsmobile and smelling gasoline fumes. I was one of the last people to, to want to get involved in, do I want paper or plastic? Bringing my own bags to the store. I've never been known as, I never thought in my life that I would be dealing with an environmental issue. But the more I looked into it, the more important it became. Because not only was it affecting me, it was affecting the health of those people that I love. It was affecting the health of my neighbors. Higher incidence of, of, of blood cancers, asthma conditions, upper respiratory diseases, all linked to diesel fuel. You're not bringing this back in my neighborhood under no circumstances. And then my neighbors got riled up. What surprised me more than anything else were the phone calls and emails and texts that I got asking me, is it time to block the construction? My neighbors were ready. They were real quiet about it, but they were ready to protest, to block the bulldozers. You are not bringing diesel fuel buses back at Northern. That's not going to happen. So, I'm not going to insult anyone's sensibilities. But I truly believe that what Northern Bus Garage is facing right now is what, in legal terms, I think is known as disparate treatment, where you treat one garage differently than you do another. You know, in a, in a court of law, they say it's not what you know, it's but what you can prove. And so there are people in this room right now that can testify and bear witness that I attended the Western Garage renovation meetings. And I plan on continuing to go. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Okay. It's important that you all understand this because I don't want to, when we get to the questions and answers, there's a lot of things that I can tell you. But this is what I want to leave you with. And I'm going to give credit to the person who I heard say it. Because it's worth noting who my heroes are. Nelson Mandela was being interviewed and he was asked a question relative to all the work that he's done and 
Sometimes he won and sometimes he lost. And his response to the reporter was, I never lose. I win or I learn. That's me. That's who I am. I don't have a college degree, never went to college, barely got out of high school. I'm what is known as autodidactic. If you don't know what that is, you with the college degrees, go look it up. But I learn. I go out and I experience things on my own. I'm probably one of the best homeschoolers, non-school homeschoolers that there ever was because I taught myself. And these are the things that I've learned. And the things that I've learned, I'm willing to pass on to any and everybody. We gotta be transparent about this. It can't just be me. What I've done here, it can't die with me. It has to continue with those of you out here that you go tell somebody else, if you need help, call on me. I'll be there. That's, that's my life's work. So I thank you. Um, we'll, we'll talk further uh, when it's time for questions and answers, but I appreciate uh, the opportunity that you've given me. Thank you. That was inspiring. Um, okay, our final panelist uh, will be Opera Navarra from DC Water. Uh, DC Water, uh, with its award-winning logo and friendly blue and green branding, works hard to brand itself as the city's eco-friendly utility. Water is life, it reminds us. Opera Navora, the company's director of government affairs and public policy, will tell us what's been achieved and what remains to be done. She has worked across the utility spectrum with Atlas Gas, NRG Energy, Pepco, and Reliant Energy. Her passion is empowering communities with the tools, advocacy, and resources needed to ensure fair and balanced approaches. So with that, Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me? Perfect. Good evening. And I would be remiss if I didn't offer a happy birthday. And congratulations on all of the great work um, that you all are doing. As you can see, I am not Maureen Holman, um, but she is sending her regards. She has a little one that is on display right now at the Caps game. Um, uh, he's a skater. So, um, um, but she is, she is excited about this conversation and has worked with you all. And she told me, Opera, just stick to the themes. They want to talk about how our infrastructure cannot move, but we should be a part of the community, which is a worthy and lively conversation. Um, as my bio has stated, I have probably worked at every utility uh, between here and Houston, Texas. Um, the energy sector is just kind of where I landed, um, though I thought I was going to be Oprah or something of that nature, but I'm in the energy sector. And this is actually my first time at a water utility, but it has been fascinating. I've been at DC Water now for two and a half years, and um, the things that DC Water is doing as far as making um, our hard infrastructure and complementing that with our social infrastructure of the community is by far some of the best in class. And I've worked at Pepco, I've been at Washington Gas, I've been at other energy companies, and DC Water um, is a, a leader in that respect of the social and the human infrastructure. So I do have a presentation. I It's quite lengthy, but a lot of it I think you all already know, but um, for informational purposes, we're just, I'm going to run through a, a, a quick presentation, kind of who DC Water is, our footprint, um, and really why we cannot move, but that's also our inability to move because of uh, who we are and what we do does not negate our responsibility to you all, to the communities and the people that we serve. And the balance between those things, um, it takes real keen leadership and, and, and forethought, um, not only for the here and now, but for the future. So let's get started. If I can work. 
it's just up and down, right? Oh, here we go. So uh, briefly, like I said, we're going to go through who is DC Water. We are going to talk a little bit about our beautiful headquarters building um, that Uwe mentioned, um, a future plans for our sustainable and our resilient waterfront, um, as well as our non-process facilities master's plan, um, the NPFMP. It, it, we really need a prettier name for that, um, but um, it's some exciting work and it really talks about and it's alignment with um, our strategic values and our vision for the next five to 10 years as well. Let's see, next, oh, oh, no, oh, did I go to, okay. So DC Water, um, we are a regional authority. So that's something that's very exciting. We provide more than 700,000 residents, 18 million annual visitors, and thousands of people who are employed in the district with water and uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, we treat about, I think it's about 1.7, 1.6 um, million people in Maryland and Virginia as well, which a lot of people don't really recognize that we are a regional authority. But I think that's something that's fascinating because our Blue Plains facility, um, which is located in D.C., is the largest in the nation. Um, it covers 150 acres on the bank of the Potomac River and the southernmost tip of the district, and it's the largest advanced wastewater treatment um, uh, facility in the nation. Um, we have the capacity of about 370 million gallons per day. Um, at peak capacity, more than 1 billion gallons a day. I believe DC Water is the largest electricity user in the district. Um, and I think that's important because when we get to the end of the conversation, being the, the biggest user um, of electricity kind of how are we thinking about ourselves in the water energy nexus and in the energy nexus of the transition of energy as well? And so I think that's a very valuable and important conversation. So while we're very dynamic in what we do and in our facilities, the truth is, um, you know, our infrastructure is massive. So we have about uh, a little over four, uh, nearly 1,400 miles of interconnected pipes, uh, four pumping stations, five reservoirs, three water tanks, 43,860 valves, and about 9,510 water uh, hydrants. Um, our sewer system alone is 1,900 miles of sanitary and combined sewers, uh, 22 flow meter stations. We have nine that are off-site uh, wastewater pumping stations. There's 16 wastewater pumping stations, uh, 12 inflatable dams that we operate as well as a swirl facility. And I say all that because the bottom line is that um, we have to be here uh, <laughs> and we can't move. Um, and not only do we have to be here and we can't move, we are also built um, just with old infrastructure. I think the median age of our pipelines is about 100 years old. Um, the same for our, uh, our, our sewer lines. I think the median age of those is about 85. And so if you look at kind of the investment that's needed for the maintenance and the reliability of infrastructure, um, there's a significant cost and burden to all of that and the flow to all of that. And the concept of um, just moving or, uh, or even thinking about how we're doing business or how our hardware is instructed or constructed, um, again, takes a lot of thought and ingenuity because you're dealing with very sensitive and very old critical infrastructure. So what does that look like? Here's just an older picture of wh where we are in the district. Um, and again, the we can't be moved. Um, so when we think about the innovation, uh, you know, um, everyone is very excited. I too am very excited because it's the building that I work out of, but um, we have a lead platinum HQO. Um, it is it is the first of its kind. Um, it's really masterful in how it's designed. Um, there was a lot of work that was put into this phase of the of, of the work and what it will look like across the Anacostia. Um, it's developed, however, as Uwe even mentioned, around our historic main pumping station. It's the O Street uh, pump station. Um, 
as well as our Main Street. So we needed to take action. There's a lot of historic preservation that goes into the concern of that. Again, the the age of our infrastructure was also a concern. So the design team has spent an extensive amount and still continues to spend an extensive amount because that area is still growing and booming. Um, we are in constant conversation um, with the development actually that's literally next door to us, uh, the Brookfield um, development and what's coming there because, again, there will be more neighbors coming. And what does that mean? There's homes being built right next to our old pumping station. And so what does that look like? And what's the responsibility that we have to those neighbors? But understanding that we have an operation that's 24 hours a day, 365, you know, um, there's going to be a weird odor smell. That's just, there, there's just things that we cannot get around. But we do have to think about how aesthetically pleasing and how we are going to be a neighbor to our current and our future neighbors. This is actually the um, trunk sewer between the main pump station and HQO, which we built the stormwater management system. Um, I believe those red tanks are about, those are the two, three, or 30,000 gallon, um, those are the stormwater systems. And the structural support around the critical infrastructure is actually under that. So this is how and where the auto court parking area will be um, and balances the landscape for our main pumping station. One of the cool things also about the building, because there's a lot of preservation um, that we had to take into account as well, is that 100% of the rainfall captured on site um, is used for non-potable uses within our actual building. So it's for the irrigation of green roof and land and, and, and landscaping. Um, and of course, you have the Anacostia in the background. This is um, the gym. I call it the, the um, um, people refer to it as the, the Wizard of Oz, I think, um, but it's beautiful. Um, it, it's beautiful. Um, like I said, it sits, on, uh, it, it's, it sits on top of our existing O Street pump station. It's adjacent to the Main Street pump station. And above is this massive clay sewer line that, again, date centuries. Um, but it's six stories. It's lead platinum class A office building. Um, about 350 of our employee base work from there. Um, there's an alternative green thermal energy provided by a wastewater heat recovery system. Um, there's expanded community options. So we have figured out how to um, maximize metro and bus, uh, bus transit. There's a CAMBI system. There's a lot of uh, coordination and collaboration that has gone on with our other agency partners, um, as well as private organizations to make sure that the use of where we are and where we're sitting is sustainable, reliable, resilient, and that it looks good um, and that it's attractive. Um, the building is also, we want it to be a part of the community in a way that people can come use the facility and enjoy the facility. There's a lot of educational courses that go on at our HQ building. I feel like every other week we are hosting a tour or an event. In fact, there's an event there today on the rooftop. And so we really, uh, the access for the community to the building to come see uh, what we have built there is there's always an opportunity. And so that's a part of building that community value as well. This is more about um, the building. We've won some fantastic awards. Maureen did not want me to leave that out, um, that we are constantly receiving recognition um, for the work for the building and the work that we're doing along the Anacostia. And that just kind of leads also to the ingenuity. You know, this is not just a, a D.C. water story, but this is a, a district story. And I think that the work that we are doing uh, from D.C. water's perspective can be a model to 
to other areas that will be developed in D.C. Because as you all know, I, I'm, I'm from Houston, Texas, so, um, but I have been here for the past decade. And even within that time, I have seen this city change drastically and just the makeup of the city. And sometimes, um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of who are we attracting and what are we attracting for? And we want to make sure that um, what we're building and what we're doing um, not only is amenable to the people that we're trying to attract, but for but also to the people who use it every day, right? And so that's where uh, the questions of being a community partner, that's where the questions of equitable uses and equitable space and making sure that we're equitable and sustainable come into play. And I think that those are the real and serious conversations that DC Water is having and why we are at the top of our game and leading in the nation for a wastewater uh, utility and water uh, utility. This is more of our commitment to sustainability and reliability. It doesn't necessarily stop at the building itself. Like I said, we are building along the Anacostia. So um, our capital and investment right now along the Capitol uh, waterfront is about, it's a little over $30 million. So like I said, HQO was really just phase one. There is a $12 million uh, dedicated to improvements along the seawall there that will actually help with flooding um, in the community. There's a hardening restoration of the historic pumping station that will also help. Um, we're doing some floatable debris docks, but all of this is to really help the aesthetics and the sustainability and the reliability um, along our, actually between the Anacostia and the Potomac, that's the only water that we really have, which is a, another conversation, not for this one. Um, but we are doing work to make sure that we are treating um, the community and the environment um, as a model steward. This is more of the great preservation work um, that we are doing. Um, and again, with our plan of the kind of non-process facilities master plan that's really aligned with our strategic imperatives, um, which there are five of them, um, we have goals that are aligned. And so within our imperatives, um, it is not going to or advancing to the next screen but Mr. Gaddis would be frustrated if I did not mention our imperatives. So we have five of them. One of them is healthy, safe, and well, reliability, resiliency, sustainability, and equitably. And honestly, all of these things have to work together at the same time. So in our new planning of how we are going to be an organization that has infrastructure, um, but also is playing a role in giving back to the infrastructure and giving back to the community, all five of these imperatives have to be met in our plan. So we've had to kind of revise our plan, but as you can see on the next slide, that our what the work that we're doing is aligned with the healthy, safe, and well, the reliability, the resiliency, the sustainability, and equity. And they're all operationalized. And we also have workforce goals that go into these as well. But we're moving the ball forward in terms of our community goals um, for our facilities. And so this is more of the plan that's coming. Um, and that plan should be released in June of 2023, so I'm hearing. Um, and this is more of like our footprint in the great work that we're doing, um, sustaining the environment, uh, planting trees. We have a bee camp that produces honey. It's just, we are really thinking about all of the ways um, to connect uh, water in the environment. And we really are here in every aspect of the district. There's truly a, a nexus. Um, I think one of the things that I'm most excited about at DC Waters that we're just not a water utility. Our footprint, um, we are also now starting to maximize our sustainable energy um, footprint. And so when you think about energy projects as a, media, as, a, as a mediator for the energy transition, we have everything from a solar facility, um, we are looking into microgrids. We have some blue-green infrastructure. We're thinking about some combined thermal. Um, there's other kind of smart grid things that we're considering, and that has to do with the land mass that we have at DC Water and the assets that we have. And so it's really all about um, being the best steward and being as 
environmentally and equitably sound that we can be, understanding that um, the work that we do every day is not pretty, it's not fun, it's often disruptive to you all, um, which I totally understand. Um, but we still want to be a, the best vested partner that we can be in the work that we do. So that is the end of my presentation. I'm looking forward to the questions that you all may have, any gripes that you all may have as well, um, and taking those back to the team. So thank you. Hello? Is this working? Okay. Uh, maybe we'll wait just a minute for Talib. Where did he go? <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. I have a question for is it on? I have a question for uh Lori Brandis. Um I <laughs> that would help. Uh I'm wondering if or kind of what shape this issue is in the curriculum for planning schools um and, and what that might look like. I just I don't have any concept of that. I'm curious. You know, it's interesting. I think it's a great question. So the questions, to, the 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 question is: To what extent is industrial industrial land use planning part of the kind of traditional planning curriculum? I, I actually think it's not core to the curriculum at all, and I think it's a problem because these are very real issues in communities. And um, you know, I'm not sure that planners typically are are well prepared to 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 work on them um when i came to the district i had uh also s similar background i had um been working on uh super fun sites in the new york metro region so i had some familiarity with it when i came to 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 work here but uh in general i don't see a lot of teaching being um done uh in this space yeah, that's a great question okay now that we're all here, I'm Caroline Petty. Just to refresh your memory again, a longtime member of the Committee of 100. Um, and the I'm going to start off the conversation here with a, probably a couple of questions of my own. Uh, but then, as uh, Shelley indicated, um, we definitely invite you to ask your own questions. And if you have them, um, you can either use the microphone in the center there, um, just line up and ask away, or uh, if you don't want to use that microphone, just um, send the high sign to somebody in the front row and, and they'll bring you a microphone. Um, okay, so I, I'm going to start with um, probably a, a very straightforward and provocative question that uh, feels, especially after Uwe's um, uh, presentation just now, feels a little bit obsolete already um, because uh, I think he did a very good job of making the point that the issues associated with industrial lands in the district are very nuanced. Um, so, but, but still, um, 
I know this is a question on a lot of people's minds uh, because it came in from several different people to me. Um, and the question is, and I invite any of you uh, or all of you to answer it, is, is DC at risk of losing too much land zoned industrial to meet future needs? Uh, and if that's the case, should there be a moratorium on the loss of any more industrial lands? Um, great question. I think, you know, one thing that I find very difficult about this conversation is that it is so hard to predict what kind of land uses we're going to need in the future with respect to industrial processes. And I do think that even the whole definition of an industrial use is changing. Um, we just heard from um, from DC Water about the idea of ecosystem services, um, which is it was in one of your slides, which we don't really typically think of as an industrial use, um, but whether it's water management or whether it's the rapidly, as we heard, rapidly changing landscape of energy planning, um, including all the electrification activities associated with transportation and, 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 and our buildings, I just think it's really hard to predict what we're going to need in the future. And I think that makes it's very frustrating because, I, you know, I think we want to as generally as planners, you know, we want to have an answer. Um, and um, and it's just hard to predict where technology is going uh, and the kinds of uses, land uses that we're going to need to support tech, the technology of the city. Um, one of the things that I've thought about when I was invited here is to take a look at what our lives were like before there were airplanes, helicopters, you know, other different areas that we now seem to, you know, just kind of take for granted. And what I recognized was we always studied nature. When the Wright brothers decided they wanted to invent a plane, they studied birds. So when you get on a plane now and the plane gets ready to land, you'll hear the pilot may say, are the flaps up? Well, if you ever watch a bird, when it lands, it puts its flaps up. A bumblebee is aerodynamically not supposed to be able to fly. It's too heavy in the butt. It, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be going anywhere. But we have helicopters because they study the insects and animals. So when we start talking about industry, I got to thinking about the animals. Most of them live underground. You don't see a hibernating bear. You better not. <laughs> the, you know, our pesky rat problem that we have in the city, they're underground. Most of the animals and the insects, they live where you can't see them. And so, when I think about certain industries, maybe not DC water, because I mean, you know, the, the water's already kind of underground as, <laughs> as it is. But when I think about bus barns, that's why I'm here. There's no reason in the world why they can't be underground. None whatsoever. None. And if you try to convince me that it's about money, that argument doesn't fly because everyone in this room lived through COVID. They printed so much money, they, 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 they never stopped. 24 hours a day, they were printing money. It's not the money. It's the will to want to be able to do something different. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't mean to offend anyone, because I'd be talking about myself, but we need to get rid of some of these old people. 
those that are that are thinking for us. And I'm going to use this person as an example. And I don't mean no harm to them. But Paul Wheatfield, he was the last general manager or CEO for WMATA. Been in transportation 40 years. He left there. Now he's at transportation in the state of Maryland. We got the same guy with the same ideas going from one jurisdiction to another. But the ideas don't change. It's the same old ideas that, that you and I are still living under. We need some fresh blood. We need people that can think outside of the box, that can convince the board, look, this is the direction that we're moving in. Most of the bus garages around the country now, when they renovate, they're renovating with mixed uses. I talked to the Northern, the WMATA people at Northern about creating a hub for buses, similar to what you have at the metro stations where you get off the train and there's a bank of buses there where you can go in all different directions. Well, why not have that at the bus barn? Why not get rid of this, what they call non-revenue generating routes, what bus drivers call deadhead, where there's no people on the bus when you're going from one location to another. That seems like a perfect opportunity to have an express bus. Let just people get on because they're, they're going to the same place that the bus is going. So you can get rid of, but they just can't seem to get out of their own way. And so we get stuck with the same thing over and over and over again. So when they're building infrastructure now at, at DC Wasa or any place else, they need to be thinking a hundred years ahead. Not for today, for a hundred years from now. Because when they put that stuff in the ground back during the Civil War, if they had thought ahead, maybe we wouldn't be in this position we are. And I think that we may have a very good opportunity to um, bring some new insights and innovation to the subject. Uh, because that segues neatly into my next question, which was going to be that uh, I think many of you know that the uh, Office of Planning, the D.C. Office of Planning, uh, has been charged uh, through the last comprehensive plan, charged with the responsibility of uh, conducting a study on D.C. industrial land. And, and that's, I haven't seen any evidence of it yet, but I understand it, it is underway. Um, and the, the uh, out of a concern that we may be running out of sufficient space for industrial activities, um, the Office of Planning is examining whether there some uses that are presently conf confined to industrial lands might be uh, uh, able to be um, transferred, I guess, if you will, transferred to uh, lands that now prevent those kinds of uses. Um, and you, Mr. Brandis, you, you mentioned that um, at Buzzard Point, um, where a lot of new development uh, has been occurring, that uh, the uh, existing uh, industrial uses were grandfathered in mm -hmm. and then uh, in order to allow residential uses on the site. You also mentioned um, the, the island, Granville Island in, in Vancouver, which has a multiplicity of, of different uses. Have you thought about, uh, the idea here is to, by opening up new areas for industrial uses, you expand cap capacity. Have you thought about whether there's much, much promise um, in, that, in that approach? And if so, what any specific examples? Yeah, that, that's a it's a really interesting question um, because 
our default, of course, is to push industrial uses out of our ju jurisdiction, out into the region, right? That's our default. Um, and you can see the migration of concrete batch plants out of the city into primarily to Prince George's County as, as kind of one of those trends. We, But it's, it's even interesting. I mean, if you look at the whole kind of like, um, I guess, systems um, a, a, a understanding of, of concrete production, you know, there's there are a lot of locational advantages to being in in the city. And actually, and if you, again, sorry, I'm kind of focusing on Buzzer's Point a little bit here, but when I first came to 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 DC in in 2000, we still had barges coming up um, and delivering sand and gravel uh, to to um, to Buzzer's Point. So uh, you know, there's just there's a lot of change happening because. Uh, you know, we have historically been a water dependent city, but now we're migrating into these entirely new technologies, um, especially electrification that is just cha really changing um, the way in which we think about what infrastructure and industrial use is. And I'm just thinking one example, which is um, battery storage. You know, may, maybe battery storage really is an industrial use that does need to get integrated into neighborhoods across the city and where we need to think about um, industrial uses in a similar way that we're thinking about some examples of uh, decentralized infrastructure, like all of the stormwater retention that we're doing all across the city. We think of that typically as as an infrastructure use, but um, there may be more uses like that that we want to intentionally decentralize across across the city and um, essentially integrate into what we would consider to be like normal residential zones. Sorry, it's a long answer. I want to bring Opera into the conversation here. One last question before I turn it over to the line of questioners there. Um, the we. Uh, many of us um, have the, because he was such a colorful character, have the impression that George Hawkins cha actually changed the corporate culture of, of DC water to make it more um, community um, resident oriented. Do you think that's, cor that's correct? And can you, do you remember him and can you describe some of the things he did and his legacy at D DC Water? I think that's um, a wonderful question. So I've only been now at DC Water for the past two and a half years. Uh, so I, I came honestly when um, our new CEO and general manager, I think he was in the third year of his contract. And I tell people all the time because while I hear the legacy and I have met um, Mr. Hawkins now at this point several times, is I honestly didn't know of DC Water under Hawkins. Um, so I find it uh, not odd and strange when I hear all the folks tales about him because, like I said, I've now been in D.C. for 10 a little over 10 years, and I wasn't as familiarized with D.C. water. And perhaps that was because I was on the energy sector side of things and not in the water sector per se. Um, but I, 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 I just I hadn't heard of him. Um, but whatever impression that was left um, is definitely one um, that that follows him. But I do think that D.C. Water, especially under the leadership of Mr. Gaddis, is is laser focused on um, being a utility that thinks outside of itself. And so I, I say all that to say while we are a water utility, there is a, a forethought at our leadership right now that really is drawing, trying to draw a nexus between the water utility and everything else. The water utility and what's happening at WMATA, the water utility and what's happening at Pepco, the water utility and what's happening at Washington Gas, and really being a regional authority in that way. And I think it was uh, you, Mr. Talib, that mentioned kind of being juxtaposed and we're in the nation's capital, right? And the bureaucracy, we can go on and on for days. But what I'm always pressed to remind people is that, you know, we are we are not a government agency. We are a government partner, but we are not a government agency. And so to get out of the thinking that um, 
you know, this ceiling can't be broken or we can't do this because X, Y, and Z, or we have to do a survey or we're waiting months and years to do a survey, right? I think all of those notions have to go out of the window in order for real work and progress to be done. So uh, even when you think about industrial uses and what that means and the definitions of things and how they matter and what we're moving in and who we're putting out, all of those things are, are things that DC Water, since the time that I have been there, have been lock and step in and at the forefront of everything that we're doing. Um, so I can't answer the Hawkins question. I do know that, though, uh, we were on a panel together and I was talking about public and private partnerships and he was not a fan of that. So um, <laughs> because he has a, a real belief that, um, you know, we are a, a rate based utility. The water sector is here for its people and investors should not be making a decision. But I think the point is um, the coll collaboration that's needed for the water utility um, and the investments that we give in the community. And the, the getting out of the silos. Correct. Breaking through. Okay, now let, we've got a rather long line. Oh, go ahead, Carol. I'll be quick. The, uh, the projections for population increases in this city continually come up. Um, and now we're talking about substantial increases in residential population in downtown, up to 90,000 plus more people. Um, does DC Water take a look at some of those? I mean, I presume that residential water use is different than office water use. So do we have the infrastructure for it? And is that something you all worry about and or look at? Or does anybody coordinate with anybody or whatever? <laughs> I think that's a fabulous question. So um, th the sad part is, I think holistically, no, we're not thinking about kind of the stress that comes on the water system with the influx of the population. Um, one fair example is, so, you know, I gave the spill about how old the infrastructure is and how we're building on top and the O&M that goes into that in the capital. Um, and we have all this development happening. And so one of the questions that I had, one of the first questions I had among uh, when I joined DC Water, because we had just gone through that historic flood that happened in September. And um, my biggest question was, well, why was this even allowed to be built here? Like we understand what the infrastructure is. So we, we know that regardless, and especially in the, the eyes of climate change, this area is going to flood. Like there's no getting, a, like there's no, Innovation is great, but I don't think that goes over God's just majestic of, of, who, of what we are and who he is. So it, it, some things are just like, well, why did we even do that? Why were we allowed to, like, where was D.C. water in that plan? And so right now we are, the mayor has an initiative um, under her policy and innovation, but it's really kind of to look at um, permitting and how we're permitting and why we're permitting and what can be permitted in that permitting process. Because... At the end of the day, there should have been a DC water to say, you know what, we probably shouldn't build that, or maybe there's a different type of way to build, right? And so having the authority and the vested and the understanding to do that is what's necessary. So I will say that I don't think that while there is a, while we do think about and we're happy about who's coming and what's coming, right? Because we think that that's adding to the, the bottom line. There is the stressor of making sure that we can sustain the capacity of that. And right now we, we, we can't, right? And so that takes careful forethought and planning to Mr. Talib's point, thinking kind of more in advance, more than just the here and now of what looks good and what's pretty and what's fun to what is this going to look like 50 years from now? I just want to remind people, please uh, keep your, we're running short on, t on time. Please keep your questions short, no follow-ups, and please keep your answers short, too. <laughs> Great. This is a question in the same vein, and it's to Ui. It's been very disappointing in the city to see large developments take place with virtually no impact studies. I mean, they're, in many cases, a joke. What are you doing to imprint on your students that these things are absolutely necessary? Um, well, uh, you know, we have a whole series of legal um, frameworks for when special studies need to be made. I, I think for me, the easy, quick answer 
comprehensive planning. We have to really take the comprehensive planning process very seriously and um, not just say things, but really think things through. And I think this issue of industrial uses is, is a great example. I mean, um, the comprehensive plan has to really guide us um, because investments will happen and changes will happen, we know. Um, so we're going to be looking to the next iteration of the comprehensive plan to really lay out these uh, in infrastructure and industrial uses and the needs for it very thoroughly. So I'm glad you're going to hold the city's feet to the fire. I had a quick question for our DC water representative. Um, and then I had a general one. So, and, and I'll take both answers together. My quick question for you is, um, what's DC Water doing to uh, kind of clean up its past sort of history um, that led to environmental racism, you know, especially in the vicinity near the um, Blue Plains site? I love the way you went from DC Wassa, you know, water and sewer to just DC Water, but you know, like we still live with the legacy of and sewer in Southeast. Okay, and my quick question to all of you is now, um, we've got, um, I think there might be more willingness to embrace industrial uses if they would, uh, if they led to livelihood improvements uh, for some of our residents. And uh, mostly we feel industrial uses as <coughs> oppression. And you were pointing out that in Pittsburgh and elsewhere, they were kind of up vehicles of upward mobility. So why don't we bring in more, um, I guess, industrial uses that are going to lift up the, our um, structurally unemployed population? So real quickly to respond to the um, correcting past injustices, you know, I. Uh, in the in the wake of kind of the new wave of equity and um, you know progressive and inclusivity and all of the justice forty conversations, I think it really just comes down to being intentional um, and having uh, diversity of thought and leadership in the room at every situation. So I will give you a prime example. Um, there was a situation in Ward Three. The pressure, you know, the the fo the water, the folks are just adamant that the water pressure is just subpar. They want better water pressure and I get it. And so on the call on to how, like how to respond, because at this point they have brought in all the council, you know, they're getting, they're weighing it in. Right. And I'm sitting there, I'm listening and I'm like, well, you know, we're dealing with a part of DC that one can afford to do that. Right. Um, and can afford to be seen and heard. So, and all of those things. And so I'm like, okay, well, we can hurry up and spend the thousands of dollars, right, just to quiet this community and satisfy this community. But that same amount of ingenuity better be put into Wards 7, Wards 5, Wards 8. And so if we're not doing, if that's not a part of the plan, then it's not a comprehensive or an equitable plan. And so... And right there, that's where we have to start with the conversation. So we have now set in place, um, how do we make equity a part of our asset management? And what does that even look like, right? So what are the tools that we need? What are the questions that we're asking when we talk about the investments now back in our infrastructure and making sure that those investments are the same across the board and not even just the same across the board, but are restoring and justifying areas that have been left behind inequitably first. And so that's what's happening now. Um, and I'm missing your other question, but maybe it wasn't for. <laughs> I think that was probably aimed more at. Um, <laughs> so, what is the benefit of industrial uses? I think the simplest uh, justification is, is jobs. It's jobs. That's how b people are going to benefit from industrial uses. And I think the. And I'm going to say something extremely idealistic right now, and that is that if we can think about industrial uses and hopefully um, re regulate them in a way so that they don't produce the negative externalities that we so often associate with them, of you know, exhausts and other forms of water pollution, and, 
if, if, if we can kind of take care of that in some way, or if technology can take care of that for us, then we're looking at a, a really kind of different kind of value proposition. And I'm thinking a little bit about like food production, right? So we have all these ghost kitchens that are being discussed or in some cases being implemented. It's kind of an industrial use, I think. It's not a restaurant. It's in more of an industrial. It's jobs, right? Or if we think of... Um, the um, d different opportunities associated with maker spaces and new technologies of 3D printing. And it's kind of, I think of that as kind of industrial, right? It, it's, it doesn't fit neatly into any of our traditional land uses. And um, I think the opportunity is, is, is to produce jobs. And as a resident of Ward 5, I think of brew, brew pubs along the Met Branch Trail. Industries, industrial neighbors, industries produce waste, mm -hmm. all kinds of waste, pollution, air pollution, water pollution. We've seen the Anacostia we learned last month went from 40 feet deep to now 8 feet, 5 feet, 3 feet in some places. Um, do you, can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts about circular economy to use the what reuse produce uh, products or reuse waste in different ways that are beneficial. <clears throat> Great. Um, how, how many people have been to the community forklift? Um, so um, one of the big challenges we have as a, as a society and certainly as a city is to begin to get our car carbon um, into balance and we have a law in, in in the city that says we're going to be a net zero um energy city in by the way in just 22 years uh so we have 22 years to to not just figure this out but to actually implement it to implement it um and um and so thinking about material flows in the city is a huge issue i think the circular economy idea is profound and um and so there are spaces that we're going to need in order to be able to manage the material flows. And, you know, it's, 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 I think we're just beginning to, you know, take recycling seriously. Um, we're not even really composting uh, as a city. These are all, I guess, they're either infrastructure or, or industrial uses, and they have to be somewhere. And so I think that needs to be part of the conversation. Yeah. And these are going to have to be our last two questions. No, oh, I, I've, I've been sitting here lis listening to this, and, you know, my, the way my mind works is, I mean, I, I've lived in this city all my life, and I don't really recall any industry here. I mean, I remember the ice house at, you know, Uline Arena, um, you know, like that. Um, industry here, unfortunately, we live in a city that, basis success on the amount of alcohol sales they are. So the biggest industry we got going right now are breweries on every corner. Now it's an industry and yes, it produces jobs, but um, there was a company here that made mops uh, over in Northeast. I can't think of, the, I can't think of his name right now, um, but, but I know it. Um, but he, he, he made mops. We don't have any place here that produces brooms, dustpans. We just had the pandemic, and half of you all in the room couldn't get toilet paper and paper towels. Yeah. So when you start talking about industry, what, what are we talking about here? <laughs> you know, I mean, there, there's a, but, but I do agree with you that we need to start thinking about it from the aspect of what is going to produce a job. And when you showed that slide of Pittsburgh and the steel mills, well, those were the people who, who worked at the steel mills that lived in the neighborhood so that they could get up and just walk to work. They had to worry about no public transportation. And, and if there was any public transportation, four or five people would pile into one car because we go, all go into the factory. We haven't had, we have not had that type of experience here that 
I can recall in the District of Columbia. So we need to really start, you know, thinking about the kinds of things that we can produce. I mean, I would encourage, if it was me, I would encourage everybody that's a, that's a homeowner or an apartment dweller, have your own garden. Produce your own food. I mean, you can, you know, squash grows like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but 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 you can just start thinking what is it that you could do for yourself that would also help your neighbor that would also perhaps give a job to your neighbor's teenage son that you know spends more of his time skateboarding and playing you know video games than he does trying to be productive so i mean that that's kind of the way that that, that I look at this. So there's quite an active conversation going on in the city right now that's extremely salient to today's discussion around utilities and around justice and climate in terms of the conversation around um, in, installing new natural gas pipelines um, and gas infrastructure. And, um, you know, <laughs> I can see how there are two sides of, you know, wanting to upgrade the infrastructure and then also concerns around health and environment and justice. I feel like you three are all really well suited to add insights to that conversation. I'm, I'd be curious to know what you have to say. Is this, is this yeah. Oh, yeah. Cool. Well, I, I just want to, like well, I, I'm going to here's so here's my short answer to that question. Um, the uh, the Climate Commission, in its second report, uh, the first recommendation is that the city needs to pass a law which um, requires a long-term plan for the reduction of use of, of natural gas. Um, and so um, that's my short answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that, that's going to be hard to do when you got the gas company on a tear now. I mean, literally tearing up streets, putting in, you know, these these new lines. In some cases, they, they're not even necessary, but they're putting them in now. And we're going to look up once this plan is in place, and that's going to be a stranded asset. You know, and, and, and that's, that's a problem. Well, yeah, I was going to say the stranded asset. So, um one thing that I, I just don't think that happens a lot in the energy sector is just kind of the question of um, who's the expert, what works, and who's who's going to bear the brunt, right? And so um, one thing, and this is me coming from the gas company, right? So I was with Alta Gas. That was actually the company that acquired Washington Gas. And... Um, you know, one of the pieces that we had to come up with was kind of this climate business plan, right, to address the aggressive goals and targets. But at the same time, we also had to come up with a plan to restore the gas lines, right, um, in a hurry. And so those seem like very counterproductive, right? But the truth is, in the, there, there's there's so much when we talk about uh, the energy transition that I just don't know if we have the infrastructure that's built for. So we talk about like electrify, electrify, and it sounds good and it sounds great, but one, who's paying for that? And um, when that electricity is down, have we talked about like, the backup storage and what that looks like. And where is that facility going to be placed, right? Like those are like not conversations that are happening in the like electrify, electrify. Um, and water plays a big role in that as well, because we also don't think about, DC is the only place out of our partners in Virginia and Maryland, in the event that our water system is compromised, we don't have a backup plan. We, we don't have a secondary water source. And so the, like those are like the real conversations. And while I am very excited about the future and, the, and, and kind of getting to this cleaner and renewable, no one has really explained how we get there, which is why you have, you know, backing off of goals when you think about just, just 
this week, the building performance standard, right? That's supposed to be a 2026 goal. But now we're thinking, well, maybe no, not. So it's we're coming up with all these arbitrary things because we're not sitting down and being intentional um, and just bringing thought leaders into the conversation. So um, it's touchy. It's, it's, it's hard. I don't think there's one solution, but I think people like you should be in the room when, you know, to ask those questions on how is this actually going to be operationalized and done. And you get the last question. Thank you. I'm Gail Sonneman. I'm here representing Ward 3 Housing Justice that urges more affordable housing and true community engagement in land use planning. I'm, I'm here to ask about Friendship Heights. This was a, a perfect lead in. Friendship Heights, which does not have much affordable housing, very little affordable housing, um, has two highly significant sites that WMATA plans to now uses and plans to use, encompassing nearly 10 acres. And what you've explained to us that WMATA is not a government agency, we get it, neither is water. Um, but how can we get the highest use, possible use, getting the city and WMATA to work with the community so that we have affordable housing and so that we have two sites and a plan for both before the development of the first one starts? Well, you know, I'm in, I don't know if I should be answering this question because I'm kind of biased. I mean, I, I, I want to see, <laughs> I, want, I, I want to see, yeah, I, I, I want to see that happen. Um, I want to, and that is when I say, I, I mean, Northern Bus Barn Neighbors wants to work with you all to see that come into fruition um, because it makes sense. Um, when you start talking about, and we really didn't touch on this, but for me, it goes directly to this concept of racial equity. Now, the problem I'm having with it is this. All of the things that I've looked at in terms of racial equity as it relates to the comp plan, OP and zoning and agencies like them are going to be looking at these things ward in each ward. So it's the racial equity component in ward three. Well, that ain't no racial equity. You're talking about one group of people in one particular ward. I want them to start looking at this from a city's perspective. How is what it is you doing in Ward 3 affecting me in Ward 4? At least in Ward 3, they're considering housing and mixed use with the bus garage being underground and all electric. They didn't give Ward 4 that same consideration. And when you start to look at racial equity, look at the word racial and look at the word equity separately. Because equity has two meanings. One, it can mean equal, but you've got equity in your house, don't you? If you've got a home, your home has equity. So now what I'm talking about is money. I'm talking about finances. So when I'm thinking racial equity, I'm not thinking about you trying to be equal. We're not going to solve the race problem with housing. That is not going to be it. But we can show solve some of it with money. You get some in Ward 3, I want the same thing in Ward 4. Why can't I have affordable housing at Northern? At least put in a podium at Northern. That, that's, a, um, that's a foundation construction term that is used when you want to build for the future. You put in a podium. You're not going to put the housing in right away. I'm not going to see it. I'm going to be dead and gone. But my son might see it. 
Because 30 years from now, WMATA may decide, well, let's put some housing over here. Well, now you've already got, since you're going to build the thing anyway, you've you got the foundation there. But they ain't going to listen to me. Because I don't have no comma behind my name with some letters. <laughs> but, but it doesn't devalue my contribution. As I told you earlier, they have a vision and I have a vision. If you want to see my vision, look at the Central 14th Street small area plan. They did an architectural rendering of my vision. It's in there. Now, they didn't, they're not going to put it into fruition, but it's in there. You can see, you can see the apartments on each corner, one on Decatur, one on Buchanan. You can see the townhomes that go down Iowa and wrap around onto Arkansas. Well, Mata commandeered Decatur Street took it from the district, took a street, a public street, an east-west street from the district. They did it on the strength that we needed this in accordance to an environmental assessment that was done that said we needed to cover the buses that were entering and leaving um, uh, the bus barn in order to reduce the pollution that was coming from the buses. Well, if the buses are now going to be all electric in 2027, you can give me my street back. You don't need it anymore. So, yes, I'm going to join with you, but I still got some fights up in Northwest that I've got to deal with. They're going to put a police station at the Northern Garage. The Metro Transit Police Department is going to have its headquarters in my neighborhood. Huh? And they have a they have a history, a history of treating black boys in particular as less than human. All kinds of stories. They 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 keep it on the down low. But they are an authority. They have their own police force. They can ticket you, they can arrest you. And as you saw over in Anacostia um, uh, Station, what, maybe two or three weeks ago, they shot and killed a man. Tell that you. wasn't the biggest issue, but uh, I'm sorry. I keep forgetting, man. I hate to do this. I hate to cut you off. Yeah, no, please. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting the high sign. No, I'm I'm the I'm the firm believer that um, you know conversation is what rules the nation, and it will it won't be until more collaboration and a diversity of thought and organization and of people and of industry come together that that's when real solutions are driven. I, I just I I'm a firm believer in that. Um, I don't know I haven't seen any other silo model work. So we 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 have to work together and we have to bring opposing views, opposing questions. All of that has to be at the table. Um, but who, what really also has to be at the you know, I'm always, my question whenever I start in any project initiative is who's not in the room. And whoever is not in the room is exactly the person that I want there. Conversation going and maybe take it out into the narthex where we're gonna have refreshments. Let's thank all three panelists and Caroline. Did you all notice that they got three people on this panel whose names you cannot really pronounce? <laughs> I have noticed that. I have noticed that. <laughs> okay. I also want to remind everybody uh, about our next uh, conversation, which will be May 24th here in the church, Reclaiming the Commons, the Value of Public Space. So once again, there's refreshments out in the narthex. And thank you again, everybody. Thank you.